Welcome back to part two on the Johnson 1941 rifle. In this video, we're going to be showing you how to disassemble the rifle. And then once she's broken down, we're going to take a look at the individual components and talk about some of the specific markings. Okay, we're going to address disassembly of the Johnson 1941 rifle. And we're going to start off, as always, by clearing the rifle. This particular Johnson 1941 has the bolt hold open device. So we'll lock the bolt to the rear. Make sure that the chamber is clear, and it is. And then we can begin disassembly. And the first step of disassembly is actually interesting because it's also the first step that the Marine Corps paratroopers would have used to jump this rifle. So on the right side of the forestock is a hole, and there's a detent in there. And so you could it was designed to be used with a bullet point here I'm going to use a brass punch but you push that in that detent down spring loaded and then just simply push back on the barrel move the sling swivel out of the way and you can see that the barrel lock assembly then swings down at that point just simply slide the barrel out of the shroud, out of the receiver. And now, this rifle, this is how it would have been jumped. It would have been jumped either in a container or it would have been put into a, uh, a weapons bag that would have been carried on the paratrooper and, and dropped with the paratrooper, but it was considerably shorter by disassembly. So the barrel assembly, if you want to continue disassembly, put the barrel assembly aside. And the next step is going to go ahead and be to move the bolt back into the forward position. So to do that, you push the follower in the magazine down, depress it, and then allow the bolt to go back forward. And then you will see on the right side rear of the receiver, there's an additional detent right here just to the rear and above the Cranston Arms mark. So that needs to be pushed in again this was designed to be done with a bullet and once that is in the bolt stop plate can be removed and i'm going to use a little bit of additional leverage with the the brass punch and the bolt stop plate can be removed. Flip the rifle around here. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the actual bolt stop, which just slides out. And then we have the link, the bolt assembly link. We're going to remove that from the recoil spring assembly. And at this point, the bolt will move without being under spring tension. Now, in order to fully remove the bolt, the next step is you have to remove the charging handle and the extractor. So there's a little detent on the top of the charging handle. And it's red, so you can use that with your, your fingernail. And you just lift that up. And then what you want to do, and it can be a little tricky, you want to lift it up while simultaneously sliding the bolt charging handle forward. And I'm going to try to do this here. And again, it's under spring pressure. So that then slides off the front face of the bolt. And then the next thing that you would have to remove or need to remove is the extractor, which would slide off. And then the entire bolt assembly at this point can be removed from the rifle. And to disassemble the bolt assembly, it's very simple. It's two components. You have the bolt and the bolt cam assembly. These two pieces come apart. On the bottom of the cam assembly is the firing pin retainer. This is simply a piece of sheet steel spring that pops off and then the firing pin can be removed. And that is complete disassembly of the bolt carrier. Now to disassemble the rifle into its component parts, there are two pins 
There's one here. This is a frame pin. This is a magazine pin. I'm not going to remove the magazine pin because there is a tendency for the follower to unwind, the spring in there to unwind. But we are going to disassemble the buttstock and the fire control group from the receiver. And there is a spring detent right here that latches into the receiver to keep the frame pin from being moved out while the rifle is being fired. And then once that is out, you can just simply wiggle that up, pull that frame pin out. Once the frame pin is out, you just slide the fire control group buttstock off of the receiver. And that completes disassembly of the Johnson 1941 rifle. All right, we'll start off with the bolt assembly for the Johnson 1941. Here's the actual bolt. And the bolt you can see on the top here, there is a cam roller that, that turns. Uh, the bolts were originally blued at, when they were first produced and then they were polished in all the friction bearing surfaces down to the white. And you can also see the part number, it's a B prefix 8836. None of the Johnson parts, as I've mentioned, will be serial number matching. These were all batch parts and uh, there's really no correlation between the batch numbers and the actual serial number on the receiver. And most of the original, although not all, but most of the original uh, Johnson 1941 bolts have that one, two, three there. So you can see the, uh, the bolt and the, uh, the bolt face. And then the next component that we'll take a look at is the locking cam. And the locking cam also has a cam roller on top. And you'll notice that there is also a separate batch number there here. It's an E prefix. And that will typically have some variation of uh, stamps on the back of it. And this part also has some bluing inside the, uh, the firing pin recess. And then you have the link. And the link was a stamped component. Uh, many of these will have a stamped uh, M in a circle on the, the link, the rear of the, uh, the link itself, a stamp in number, but this was a, a stamped component that was just roughly milled on the end here and the, the rest of it was left in its, in its uh, stamped form. And the next component is the actual firing pin. And you can see the, uh, the firing pin retainer and the firing pin retainer spring so that this retainer which is the circular piece and then the spring itself the retainer keeps the spring from being pushed back too far and then the final component not the final but the final that we'll be dealing with at least before we assemble the rifle is going to be uh, the firing pin retainer and this actually has a spring on it. Sometimes that spring will be broken or lost, uh, but it really needs to be there in order to, uh, to fully secure the, the firing pin in the locking cam. So to assemble this, you start with the locking cam and the firing pin, and you put the firing pin in, and you can see the uh, little raised portion of of the firing pin itself, that actually needs to go back into the cam assembly so that you can insert the, uh, the firing pin spring. So we insert the firing pin to, until that point where that raised section moves back and then you can take your firing pin retainer and just simply snap it down over the firing pin itself and that raised portion now keeps it locked into position so it doesn't go forward. And you can see the, uh, the back end of the firing pin projecting out. And then the firing pin uh, retainer spring will be at the very front end of the cam assembly. And then to assemble the cam assembly to the actual bolt, you turn this up so the cam roller is on the top which mirrors the cam roller of the bolt itself on the top. And then you insert these two parts and it's under spring tension. 
and at that point you have the bolt assembly completely assembled and you can actually push on the back of the cam assembly and push the firing pin which is under spring tension and you can see the firing pin actually come forward. Now the other components which we'll talk about in a few minutes when we install them is the extractor and again the extractor also has a prefix this is a G prefix and that's a blued component and in addition you have the operating handle which has a spring detent on the front that you can just get your fingernail in to pull, pull it up and this actually slides over the extractor and locks onto the bolt but only once it's assembled. A couple other components we'll take a look at this is the actual bolt stop this slides into the back of the receiver once the bolt assembly is installed in the receiver and this is held in place by the bolt stop plate and this is actually an exposed portion you can see this once the rifle is is fully installed and it actually slides down onto the two rails at the rear of the receiver and one other component that I'll mention is the frame pin there are actually two pins there's a, a frame pin and there's actually a magazine pin this is the frame pin and this pin has to be removed in order to remove the uh, the receiver from the buttstock assembly next we'll talk about the barrel and the the barrels and all these were were manufactured at Cranston Arms and the original barrels are going to have a couple unique characteristics unique markings to them the first is going to be this JA over 30-06 stamp and the JA stands for Johnson Automatics and you'll see additionally uh, on, on different barrels a, serials, a series of serial number stamps and one of the other things that the original Johnson barrels will have they will typically have that J stamp and all of them will have this uh, circle gladius IO stamp all the original Johnson 1941 barrels will have that and here you can see the uh, barrel number and this is a K suffix so the number is 2843 K and in almost every case everyone that I've ever seen the burial the barrel serial number will match match the the collar serial number so you can see that those two numbers match so that's something that you're going to see on all the original Johnson barrels the bushing at the front for an original is also going to have a 30-06 stamp if I can get it to focus here right up at the front it'll have a 30-06 stamp and on the bottom there will be a 41 stamp denoting the model number the Johnson model 1941 and all the barrels in their original configuration are going to have the bayonet lug which will be pinned uh, in two places towards the front of the barrel a lot of times these are either taken off or ground down if they were sporterized and then the original sight is also pinned in two places here and the sight protective ears should always be present on the original configuration now interestingly um, as uh, Canfield points out in his book which is kind of the definitive book on the Johnson 1941 some of the Marine Corps known issued Marine Corps rifles actually had these ears ground off so that the only thing that you could see would be the front sight post and I guess the Marine who did that at least one he found it easier to get a good sight picture without having these wings in the way which when you're trying to make a ready a very quick sight picture can be confused for the front sight post so they were ground off now another interesting thing that you may have noticed when you look at the the bolt is the bolt looks similar to an AR bolt with all the lugs 
in a rotating fashion around the bolt with the exception of this channel here for the extractor and there are corresponding lugs on the the barrel collar so you can actually headspace this weapon when it's outside of the the uh, the receiver and the way you do that is you want to ensure that the this this lug here which is a an alignment lug is on the bottom and then you also want to make sure that when you try to headspace this that the cam rollers are going to be on the top so what I'm going to use here are standard uh, climber go uh, and no-go gauges for 30 out 6 we'll start off with a the no-go gauge and you can see here this is a no-go gauge for 30 out 6 so I'll insert that into the breech and then we'll insert the bolt assembly into the collar and it will turn but just a little bit so there's not much of a turn so that is correct with the go gauge we'll put that in the breech and then insert it and it will actually rotate and you can see that it rotates all the way around so we know that this rifle barrel head spaces with the bolt so it'll go from here and it'll go down into a lock position so we know that this will head space whereas the no-go gauge wouldn't turn at all so that's a quick way to head space the 1941 uh, when it's actually disassembled next one to take a look at the uh, fire control components uh, that are in the buttstock part um, you can see here we have the the hammer spring and the hammer strut located back here and this part here I wanted to mention briefly um, this is actually the bolt stop assembly and uh, for, for whatever reason Melvin Johnson didn't really believe in having a bolt stop uh, on the Johnson 1941 and what the bolt stop essentially does is after the last round is fired this uh, comes up and it actually locks the bolt to the rear so about half of the Johnson 1941 rifles that I've seen do not have this part and it simply just comes right out it's secured in place with the frame pin um, but about half of them do not even have that component and it doesn't really affect the functioning of the rifle and you can see here on the hammer itself there's actually an assembly number here as well and this is a C prefix um, but that is uh, a component this this bolt hold open device is something that's missing on about half of them and this particular one has it and then on the bottom here you can see the uh, the trigger guard and the safety switch and then all of the original configuration uh, Johnson 1941s the ones that are still in their military configuration are not going to have wood plugs on this which holds the uh, the fire group assembly into the stock and it goes through to both sides similarly at the rear typically on sporterized versions this will be plugged with a a wooden dowel and and if it's still in its original military configuration you're going to see the uh, the screws there which hold the buffer assembly in place and this has the standard military configuration rear sling swivel assembly and then the the military style butt plate which is a fairly standard checkered butt plate also of note uh, early on in production they used one piece of walnut for the entire uh, butt assembly but this is a pretty wide piece of wood as you can see here and it's wide so that it provides protection to the rotary magazine so in order to cut down the use of black walnut which was a scarce uh, commodity back during the war for all sorts of rifle stocks and other things as well they use they began to use these uh, pieces that were essentially glued on and they would glue one on this side and also on the left side so that's perfectly normal some people think that's a repair it's not uh, in the later production they in order to economize on the use of available black walnut rifle blanks they would simply graft these pieces on 
on either side to give it that swell that would protect the the magazine, the rotary magazine assembly. So that's totally totally fine and normal. It's not a repair. Now we'll take a look at the uh, receiver, starting at the right rear of the receiver, and we'll start with the uh, the Cranston Arms Company triangle. Again, these were uh, manufactured by Johnston uh, Semi-Automatics, or Johnson Automatics was the name of Melvin Johnson's company. But since he didn't have the production capability, he partnered with another company and they created Cranston Arms. And again, according to Bruce Canfield, that star above the triangle is the Dutch accept acceptance stamp. And here you can see the rear sight assembly because this was, or the Dutch, a Dutch contract, the markings here are in meters, not in yards, which the United States was still using yards at that time. And there are a couple different variations of the, the windage adjustment. Um, they all work basically the same way, but this is the windage adjustment, and you can see it from the top here that it actually does adjust. You have a center there, so you can get a, a battle site zero of sorts and then adjust it to the specifics of the, the rifle you're firing. Now we'll say that when you're adjusting this for elevation, it's not an ideal thing. Um, it would typically be set probably here at 100 meters, and then if you wanted to go up, you would adjust it. Relatively easy to adjust, although this part is not the most solid part on it. So I would say that the um, the adjustments for windage are fine. It's a fairly decent standard peep, rear peep sight, but um, not a very accurate way to adjust for elevation. I mean, it, it works, but it's not ideal. All right, we'll take a look at the, uh, the little bit more of the side of the receiver focusing on the magazine. You can see the, uh, the magazine here is the loading gate. And I don't know if inside you can see that, but there is the follower and it just simply rotates around in a counterclockwise fashion. Just like the, the buttstock on unmodified ones, ones that haven't been, uh, there hadn't been some attempt to sporterize it, you're gonna see these, these screw holes on the side and that screw hole goes to the opposite side. There's also a couple of screw holes here. Those are gonna be left open. This isn't actually a screw hole here. This is access to the detent for the barrel release mechanism and spring, the recoil spring. And on the back side of the, the drum magazine is also another assembly number. And this is gonna have a prefix and then a serial number. But again, no relation to the, the serial number on the, the receiver. The magazine can be removed, but it's, it's difficult to put it back together. This cross pin here uh, similar to the receiver cross pin, which is located back here. That can be removed and the magazine can be disassembled from the receiver. And then if we look at the top here, you can see the ventilated handguard, which is integral to the receiver and give you a close up of the receiver markings, the serial number, the nomenclature, Johnson Automatics, all the patent dates here. And then if we look on the, the left side of the receiver, uh, the only thing of note here is going to be the ejector assembly, which is located right here. So there's an ejector uh, hinge pin and, a, and an ejector assembly, and that's, uh, that's what that, that semicircular piece of metal is on the left side of the receiver. And then the markings, an additional marking here, as you can note that the sight, rear sight, the elevation mechanism is designated M2. Well, that concludes part two. In the next video, part three, we're going to talk about disassembly, how to disassemble the Johnson 1941 rifle, and then we'll also have some slow motion video showing the weapon in operation.